Now, is this the kind of bread that you're wanting to make? Something with beautiful structure inside, delicious flavor? Well, folks, if you're wanting to learn to make sourdough, you found the right video. You just saw a close-up of this. Oh, man. <laughs> I'm chewing on it now. Delicious bread. Wait till you see the video. Folks, you're going to be making the best bread. Not that hard. Well, howdy, folks. Thank you for watching. This is a beginner's guide to sourdough bread. And you're in my kitchen. This is Texas Cooking Today. I'm Stuart. I'm looking forward to making this for you. Look, I wanted to go down another path for bread making. Now I've been making bread and I've been doing bread videos for years. Uh, every year I release a certain number of bread videos for Texas Cooking Today. And this year is no different. But this year I wanted to get into that heavy grained kind of bread. The ones that have a lot of big air pockets in it that have a very uh, uneven crumb on the inside and are very unique and, and stretchy and delicious. And so I'm developing those new uh, recipes now. The recipe we're doing today is a beautiful light sourdough. And this is a white sourdough. It is a very easy recipe to make. And it produces that wonderful interior, absolutely delicious interior. And uh, so what I want to do today is show you how I did that. We're going to go through the whole thing from how I made the starter uh, to how we make in the dough, uh, how we reactivate the starter, uh, how we do a lot of things. And so you're going to pick, if you've never made sourdough, you're watching the right video. You're going to get a great recipe. You're going to get a lot of technique here, and it's going to be a lot of fun. Also, if you are new to Texas Cooking Today, or if you've been watching for a while and you haven't subscribed, please do so. Right down there, click on that subscribe button, click the bell so you get notifications of when I post videos. There's a lot more stuff coming, okay? Also, I have uh, not sponsors, but I am an affiliate in some affiliate programs, okay? And these are where if you click the link in my description box, I'll make a commission. Now one is on a sourdough bread company, okay? It's Wild Grain. They produce sourdough breads and also pastas and pastries. Delicious stuff, top-end stuff. And they have a subscription model that's very flexible. So take a look at it. The link is down below. Also, if you do not already have a chef's thermometer, there's a link for a really good one down there. We'll talk about that later. Folks, Let's get on with this. This is sourdough bread. Come on over. So what I have here, this is my starter. I pulled it out of the fridge just a little bit earlier and I'm going to feed it. We're gonna give it some water and some flour. We're gonna let it blossom. When it comes up and foam gets nice and foamy, that's when I make my dough, okay? Plain and simple. Um, now this is a starter that I made just a couple of weeks, uh, I started a couple of weeks ago, uh, and it actually blossomed during my white bread recipe. So if you want to see that happen, I showed that uh, during the white bread recipe. So take a look at that if you haven't seen it. The starter, really cool stuff. Folks, the starter is not hard to make. Now, first thing I'm going to recommend is on your flour choice for a starter, begin with some whole wheat. All right, the whole wheat has a lot of nutrient in it that's really good to help, uh, to help yeast and bacteria to bloom and to grow well. Now you may get an artificial bloom when you first start making your sourdough mix. Now what that means is, you know, what you're doing is you're mixing flour and water together and you do that every day in the same bowl, in the same batch. And uh, sometimes on the second day or whatever, it'll, it'll puff up like, oh, it's active. It's not. You're going to need to give it a number of days, folks. The, generally, if it goes fast, you'll get it done in a week. I've seen it take as long as three weeks. Um, and sometimes the ones that take longer actually taste better. So that can be a, a beneficial thing. This one was a pretty quick one. It has a, uh, a sharp 
aroma to it. However, the flavor of mine is rather mild. And each starter is unique. It's unique to the yeast and bacteria floating in the air in your home, all right? That's just the way they work, folks. Uh, and I know that sounds kind of weird, like kind of odd, off. See, it's kind of billowy on top and, and rocky and foamy and, and kind of weird looking. You get right down to it. But what this is, is it's just flour and water that have collected bacteria and yeast from the air. That's all. And each time I set it out, I like to set it out in the same bowl. Because like I said, I'm trying to actually get it to be a little more robust. Um, yeah, we'll see. Now, there, as I mentioned, different starters from different areas have different flavors. So the starters that you uh, get in an area that's coastal will usually be a much sharper in its flavor. Uh, milder in its aroma and sharper in the flavor and that is because of the salt air you know there's uh, it's a higher saline content in the air uh, on coastal regions so you have more humidity there than there is here there's also uh, a, a more of a salt content there than there is here and the bacteria and yeasts in that area have become resistant to that problem which normally kill out bacteria and yeast so they have to be very strong to resist that and they taste different now here in the middle of the the grasslands of the united states of america on what we call the high plains um, the flavor of the bacteria and the yeast are a little bit different they're a little milder and um, this is just something i've learned over time um, because i've made a lot of starters okay this is not my first starter these are pretty easy to do uh, so here's what i'm going to suggest in order to make this stuff right here Take a cup, measuring cup. Scoop out one cup of flour and put it in a big wide bowl just like this. Nothing that's metal. Use something that's plastic, glass, or ceramic. That's because metal works against yeast, okay? So anyway, keep to those. Uh, the wider the bowl, the more area there is for yeast and bacteria to settle on, okay? And that's what you're looking for. One cup of uh, flour, one cup of water. Mix the two together. The next day, do it again. So you've got two cups of flour there at that point and two cups of water that you've mixed together. The third day, come back, take out some of that mixture and dispose of it. And then add another cup of flour, another cup of water, mix it together. The fourth day, do that again. Take out some of the mixture and then add some more flour and some more water and stir it. And just keep doing that again and again. And eventually, it's going to puff up and bloom. You're going to have this beautiful sourdough aroma that comes from it. And you will recognize it for what it is. Now, in the process of getting there, it may get really soupy, all right? And it may take on like a real super yeasty smell. Or it could smell like vinegar, all right? Don't worry about that. The vinegar just means you're getting a lot of lactobacillus built up. That's what you're wanting. All right, when it, it bubbles up and gets foamy, that means you've got your yeast built up. All right, so that's a good thing. You're looking for both things at the same time. You'll smell it and you'll see it. It'll be very distinct. And today you're gonna get to see what that blossoming looks like because I'm gonna add some flour and water to this and then we're gonna mix it together. We're gonna allow it to warm up and do its thing. And when it fills this up most of the way, I'll scoop out enough to make our dough, okay? And so this way we're not actually using the yeast like you buy at the store. We're using the yeast that you have at home already. I have just finished adding one cup of flour and one cup of water to this right here. This is my, my starter and um, what I've done is I've just mixed that in there. It's kind of lumpy right now. It's a mess. I don't have to mix it real well. It just has to be mixed in. The enzyme in this and the yeast in this will do the rest of the work for me. Now, folks, so you'll know, there are a lot of, uh, this is a culture item, and there's a lot of anaerobic activity going on here. First of all, in wheat grains, like, uh, you know, any kind of uh, wheat or barley wheat, any of those, there's a couple of enzymes in there 
that will break down those starch chains that are in the flour. And what happens when that happens is it actually makes the dough sweeter. That's one of the things that gives you that sweet characteristic in your dough. And um, so that's what's happening just from the grain itself. And when you're using a whole wheat grain, there's a lot more of that in there and it acts better that way. So you get an even more sweet flavor. I don't use whole wheat every single time I feed this. I use it about every fourth time. So I'll feed it three times with this and then once with whole wheat and I just kind of bounce back and forth. I could use a little of both each time and I'd probably get better balance. But you know, it's not one of those things where I'm gonna put that much concern into it. This isn't that hard to make. All right, so I have fed it. You see the way it is now. We're gonna see it in a little bit after it rises up. It's gonna get foamy and bulky and there'll be a, a lot of air bubbles on the inside of it. You'll see that when we scoop it out of it. Uh, kind of a, almost a foamy consistency on the inside, but sort of a cross between that and a batter really. Anyway, that's what we have going on here. The other enzymes that are in here, that lactobacillus that gives it that nice soured flavor uh, is very mild on this one. So I've uh, got one that's mild. And then the yeast that I have in this is all wild yeast. It's a fairly active yeast. It does very good for me. So I'm quite proud of it. Um, we're gonna get into some other videos later on on how to gather yeast and to make a yeast mother from different locations. You know, taking yeast off of vegetables and things like that. Now in just a little bit, we're gonna get busy making a batch of dough. All right, and it's gonna be our sourdough dough. However, this is a batch I made yesterday using the exact same measurements and the exact same technique that I am showing you here today. All right, so this is just pre-made from yesterday. It's kind of jiggly in there. This is a high hydration dough in case you're wondering. And if you look down in here, you can see a lot of the character of the way that dough is going to come out later. Okay, this is what I'm looking for. This is kind of the shape of the interior of the dough that I'm wanting. Lots of big pockets of air, a lot of unevenness to it, irregularity. That's what I'm looking for, along with a very stretchy bread, a nice sourdough flavor, oh, and a good crust. Now the crust this particular high hydration dough produces is a very tough crust, but it's not one of those crispy, crunchy crusts unless you cook it a second time. If you re uh, cook this loaf, that crust then gets hard. And I mean like crackery crisp. So quite unique. Uh, hydration level on this is a little over 80%. In fact, it might even be as close as 83 or 84%. And that is because the starter that I use is a very high hydration starter and it bumps up the fluid level on this. Otherwise, it starts at 80% and then the starter brings it up from there. All right, now, this is simple enough. This right here was made with flour, salt, and water, along with a little, one cup of my starter. Or you might just say 200 to 220 grams of that starter. The measurements I'm gonna show you for this is all done in grams, and every bit of it is gonna be weighed out. Now folks, if you don't have a scale for weighing stuff in the kitchen, I can honestly say this is one of the most important things that you're ever gonna have in the kitchen right here, is your scale. You need a scale, you need it to be a good quality scale that reads accurately. So just go out and get one. They're not expensive, okay? But they're worth their weight in gold and they make very, very accurate measurements. So we're gonna be weighing the water, we're gonna weigh the flour, we're going to uh, build our dough that way. And that way, each time I make my dough, it's identical to the time before. All right, there we have it. This is what we're gonna be taking care of in just a minute. I'm gonna take this and fold it a few times, and then I'm gonna cut it in half, turn it into two loaves on greased baking sheets. And while these are rising up, we'll be waiting for the starter to do its thing. And I'll show you how the dough is made uh, while at the same time we're baking up the very same thing, okay? A lot of people make sourdoughs in different ways. Some people will rise the dough inside of a, uh, a pan or a pot that's actually designed for that. And others will just put it where it's gonna be baked and rise it up in that location. Now, guess what, folks? I'm one of those people. I just put it right on the pan 
and rise it up right where I'm going to be baking it. So everybody has a different way of handling their pans. Some people will do what I did and butter it. Some people will put down a little oil. Others will just leave it dry. Some people bake on a silicone mat. Others will use cornmeal. Folks, pick yours, okay? Try different ones and whichever one seems to work best for you, just go with it. For me, I get a good release off of the bottom of my loaf just doing it this way. And it also gives it a nice smooth, slick area for that loaf to rise against. In other words, there's not any resistance on the pan. So the bread just kind of does its own thing naturally. And I'll say this, these loaves don't seem to rise up in their initial rise as much as my white bread does. And that is in part because of the lactobacillus breaking down a lot of the gluten in the bread. It's really lowering the gluten because it's eating a lot of it. It doesn't reduce it enough to say, oh, it's low uh, gluten or anything, but it is lower than white bread, certainly. That's one of the reasons sourdoughs are considered a little healthier. Uh, so anyway, make sure your pans have something on it to resist sticking, and that way you'll be a little happier in the end. Okay, let's take a look at the dough that I've had sitting in the refrigerator overnight. This is what we call an overnight ferment. Now, if you notice, I grab a hold of it and that stuff just sticks right to me, but it's not coming off on me, okay? Now, it can, but like here, see, they're starting to. What do I do to prevent that? Do I flour my hands? Let me show you a trick. There we go, I put some water on my hands. So I'm gonna reach under this and kind of break it loose on the sides. Look at all those air bubbles just already forming. They're all over it. Now I'm gonna raise him up. I'll fold him under. Get off the side there. I'm gonna turn it a quarter of a turn and do that again. Now what this is, is it's helping to develop those gluten strands. It's also building tension in the dough. Now it's getting to the point where the dough doesn't want to stick or stretch very much. It just kind of wants to hang there in a big glob. So it's not stretching now. And that is because we've developed that gluten through this technique. All right. And I want to show you that here in just a little bit. Now you get to see the dough after it has been developed. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to wash all of this gluten I've got on my fingers that has them nice and sticky off. But you've seen now how to handle it without necessarily getting it all over yourself. And remember, this is really high hydration dough. I'm about to divide it into two parts. We're going to shape it and get it on the pans. All right, so get my dough ready to be turned out here. I need to take some flour. This is the same flour that I used when I was making the dough, okay? So, wonderful stuff. This is a high gluten flour and it's actually a little bit higher in gluten than is uh, bread flour. Most bread flours are around the 12 to 13% gluten. This is 14 and a half. I ordered it from a uh, restaurant supply and if you want to know more about these flours, I did a video on it not long ago. Take a look. Okay, come out of there you, there we go. Okay, this guy. We first start just by a light dusting, a little bit of flour on the outside. It just helps it uh, be a little bit more workable. I'm going to try to split it into two as even as much as possible parts. Now where I have that open edge where the interior is showing, I like to just pinch that shut like that. There we go. I just do that on both of them. There we go. And then I roll it over onto itself. So I'll put that seam face up and then I'll take this and stretch it a little bit and roll it. Stretch and roll, stretch, roll. There we go. Just set them aside. Same thing here. Stretch, roll, stretch, roll. There we are. Okay, hey, now again, sticky everywhere, right? When we're dealing with high hydration like this, that's just part of the game, folks. So get ready for it. Now, we'll move him back, leave him in place. What I wanna do is I wanna take this dough that I have here and tuck it under here on the ends, right? Just like so. 
And that's because I'm trying to form tension. I want the outer surface of the dough to be stretched tight, similar to the way a balloon might stretch tight, all right? The whole idea there is by stretching it tight, helps it to rise vertical as well as out, all right? That tension gives you better shape and better rising, okay? And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna move my hands this way while I'm moving them in, okay? So, like this, all right? So what that's doing is it's taking this and pulling it under. Now, if you're sticking a little bit, go across the top of the dough with a little more flour, okay? Because that's the part that's getting pulled under and stretched, okay? There we go. There. Now, I've almost got him done. I'm about to set him on one of those pans I've just buttered. Okay, there we go. It goes to the pan. All right, I'm gonna do the same thing all over again right here. Well, there they are. Look at that beautiful little loaves. And look at this, look at my hand, the size of my hand as a comparison. We can use that later uh, as kind of a guide to how much these grow. Now, there's two things you can do when you're making bread like this. You can uh, proof it to where it is fully, um, well, to where it is ready to be slashed. And that's when it's pretty much doubled in bulk. You'll be able to push in on the surface of it and instead of it bouncing right out like it did right then, it'll slowly come back out. If you push in on that surface after it's risen up and it doesn't bounce out at all, then you've overproofed it. At that point, don't cut it, just put it in the oven like it is. This kind of bread will cook up either way, whether it's overproofed or whether it's properly proofed and you cut it. Alrighty, now that I've got these rising up, I'm going to use a pastry cloth. A lot of people have a special bread cloth or something that they can use for stuff like this. Folks, this is just a regular, average, everyday pastry cloth, which is nothing more than, you could say, a small sheet of a cotton sheet. Very simple. All right. Now, I want that kind of loose around those, and I don't want too much of it pressing on them. I want them just so they can rise up underneath it and have no resistance whatsoever from my cloth. And they will do just fine. This will also keep drafts off of it, keeps it from drying out, and gives you a very beautiful loaf. At the same time, if you're using the right kind of stuff, you don't have to worry about it sticking. If I covered it with a plastic wrap, the plastic will certainly stick, but this cloth does not. All right, it has been an hour now. So I've got an hour on the rise on the bread, an hour on the um, starter. Let's take a look at these, see how they're coming along, come on. All right, first off, let's take a look at our loaves. Well, now looky there. That has almost, not quite, almost doubled from where it was, but they are still springing back quickly. They're still doing a lot of rising. So let them go, they're not done. Okay, while those are doing their thing, the starter here. Okay, let's take a look. See how that starter has risen up? It was about an inch and a half down from the top here when we finished adding in the flour and water. And now it is only about a little more than a half inch from the top. So it has risen up quite a bit. It's almost doubled in bulk. It's kind of lumpy on top, very frothy, kind of bubbly looking and it is producing a beautiful aroma. Let me, uh, mm, yeah, that's beautiful. It's a strong, sour smell to it, which is that bacteria, so slightly vinegary. It's got that beautiful yeasty smell to it. It's got that lovely yeast color to it also. You know, earlier I mentioned the importance of that uh, cooking thermometer in the kitchen. I'm just gonna take a quick moment to mention this one again. Uh, folks, take a look at this down in the description box, there's a link for chef's temp. And this is a chef's temp right here. That uh, display is facing upright, but if you turn it, still facing upright. Turn it upside down, still faces upright. 
I need to relight that back display, not a problem. It's just that easy. This thing, this thing, a really cool thermometer. I really like this thing. It's easy to hold. It's got a simple narrow probe. It does not mess with things very much. And if you'll notice how quickly, let me put my finger down here. Boom, see how that shoots right on up? Reads the external temperature of my skin easy and quickly. Let's take a look right here. My starter right now is at 68 and a half degrees. Now let me tell you, sometimes such things are quite important. Depends on the recipe. And knowing the exact temperature of something will make a big difference in the outcome and the quality of the product. It's just plain good sense to have a good quality chef's thermometer. Give that a try. Chef's temp. Now folks, let's get on with making this. This is so simple. Okay, so the couple of things I've got to measure out here. I've got to measure the water. I have to measure out the flour and I have to measure the salt. Now the salt I'm going to do with a spoon. That's easy enough. It is the water and the flour that I need to do. All right, so this is the bowl I'm going to mix it in. So I just measure it into that. I'm showing zero grams here, so it's already zeroed out. I need for this recipe 558 grams of flour. That's pretty simple, isn't it? And that's generally about four cups. Um, depending on your measuring cups, it could be a little different. Come on. 545, 552, 558 right there. Okay, so you can see, jumped up to 560. You can see how very accurate this is. There we go, two grams of flour right there. It makes the recipe so easy to measure also. Look how fast and easy that was. Dry ingredients get way more simplistic when it comes to measuring. Now the salt. Now on this, in case you're wondering, Total is seven grams of salt. Okay, there it is, 563. Okay. So this time, I guess five grams of salt? No, yeah, the, my apologies, I was wrong. It is, it's five grams, <laughs> four to five grams. So that's all there is there. So now this is ready with the exception of, I don't want the salt sitting on top. So I simply stir it in and I do that so I don't place my starter directly against the salt. That salt will kill some of the yeast in the starter, but if it's mixed into the flour, it will be dispersed enough to not mess with it. All right, now, time to measure the water. Let me zero my scale here. And I need 446 grams of water, which by the way is about five, oh, should be 15 and a third ounces. All right, so yeah, very exacting, much more so than volume measuring. Now the starter part can be a little messy, so I'm gonna save myself some cleanup on my scales by putting down a little protection. Now generally a paper towel will weigh about one gram, so I don't think it's gonna be enough to matter for us. All right, now, scoop out some starter here. Right. Let's weigh that real quick. 235 grams, a little bit on the heavy side. So I'm not going to lose any sleep. If I've got just a little extra in there, I'll just not clean out my cup quite as thoroughly as I normally do. Okay. So on the whole, as you can see, this is a really super easy way to make bread dough. Looky there, we've got our starter in there. Our flour's already in there. Here's the water. Mm-hmm. All I have to do is stir that together. And this becomes what we call a high hydration dough. Okay, so the measurement that I gave you on the water and flour ratios, those will give you about an 80% 
uh, hydration ratio, okay? And that is the um, amount by weight of water relative to the amount of flour. All right, and that's what that is. So 80% of the weight of this dough is going to be, um, or 80% by of this dough is water. All right, the duh, I'm sorry, I'm having a hard time here. Okay, so this doesn't have to be mixed perfectly. You're just looking to get all the ingredients incorporated, and that's what we got right there. And I want to put it in a glass dish to rise. Number one, yeast, as I've mentioned to you, will react with metal, okay? It reacts with salt, it reacts with metal. There's a few things that yeast just doesn't like. It's just in its nature, all right? Some metals will react more, all right? <laughs> and that's just all there is to it. So I just avoid metal altogether. Stainless generally doesn't react much with yeast. It doesn't hurt it too badly, but it does interfere with the rising a little bit. It, uh, it's not as strong a rise in stainless as you get in glass, ceramic, or um, plastic. So rise in something like this. Uh, all I have to do now is I'm gonna put plastic wrap over this, cover it, 45 minutes later, we're gonna come in here and manipulate the dough. And that just means to knead it some in order to get the gluten strands to form better, all right? And that doesn't mean any heavy kneading. It's gonna be really super easy, like you saw me do earlier on that other dough, very much like what we're gonna do here, all right? So don't make this a chore. Just be patient and relaxing with it. The first 45 minutes, what's what we call autolyzing. It's where the gluten is beginning to form and, uh, and to generate, and the strands are beginning to form. Uh, this being a high gluten dough makes it really stretchy, and it's also really fun to work with. I'll say this has been my favorite flour of all flours, so it's fun. Okay, let's take a look at these now. They have come out much larger, much a little bit taller. So they're doing their thing and they're filling out and they're coming out beautiful. Uh, so they're doing exactly what I'm hoping they will do. So this is still springing back fairly quick. You see that? It's just coming right back out. Um, now, it is slowing down a little bit. So I'm looking at about, I'm just guessing here. I would guess maybe another 30 minutes and it is finished proofing and it could be cut open and then put in the oven. However, in this case, we're not gonna do that. We're just gonna let them keep rising up. In 30 minutes from now, I'm gonna turn the oven on, which means these are gonna rise a little more. One of them is gonna go in the oven and the other one's gonna sit out and rise even further, meaning it's gonna overproof. And I'm doing this on purpose to kind of show you how real easy it is to get a fantastic bread, even if you just let it overproof, you don't worry about it and you don't worry about uh, slicing it. Remember, this is sort of a, a beginner's bread making for sourdough. And I didn't want to make it complicated. And I thought if I can get around that, that cutting the bread thing, that messes with a lot of people. So we're not going to mess with that right now. We'll get into that on another video uh, later on. Now this has been 45 minutes in the autolyzing time. Okay, so that first rest after you make it, 45 minutes, it can be longer, it can be an hour, but you wanna give it just enough time to get the job done. So this stuff, this stuff is really stuck to the bowl. The gluten is just beginning to form, but it isn't fully developed yet. And so it's gonna be sticky and it's gonna get all over my hands. I don't want to touch it with dry skin. Remember what I showed you earlier, wet hands. Okay, so let me do that. All right, wet hands, perfect. So all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna kind of loosen it here around these edges and then on the sides towards me, I'm gonna pinch inward at the bottom and pull up. It's not gonna come completely. I wanna set it back down. Look, it just folded over on itself. Let's do that again. There it came out. Now, if I fold it down onto itself, rotate this a quarter of a turn. See, some of it's coming off, but not bad. So here we go, reach in again, the same way, fold it over onto itself. Quarter of a turn, 
reach in, pull it up, and see there how it's starting to get stiff. And that's that gluten doing what it does, okay? That's a good sign. There we go, folding it over. And by the time I'm done doing that, it's gonna be very difficult to get that fourth fold in there. But this is a great way to knead it. You can even have bad arthritis the way I do. And it is not hard to do your dough this way. Now I'm going to do this two more times. After the second time, uh, or on the third pass, the third time I knead it, I'm gonna put it into the refrigerator. I'll cover it, put it in there, and give it 24 hours. Okay, I'm getting my oven ready for cooking bread. So I wanna go ahead and put a skillet on the bottom of my oven. Now, if you've got an electric oven that has a uh, element on the bottom, then you, of course, wanna put it on the bottom rack. Uh, if you've got a gas oven, you can, a lot of times, you set it directly against the bottom of the oven. Uh, and your oven is gonna be different than mine, so you're gonna have to kind of work around this. Uh, that's for water, hot water. What I'm gonna do is take some water, put it in this pan. I'm gonna bring it to a boil on the stove while I'm preheating my oven. The oven, when it gets to 400 degrees, I'll then be able to start baking my bread. Now I've got one loaf ready to go up in there and the other one is gonna sit here and just keep over, basically overproofing. That's okay. You're gonna see it's not gonna make a whole lot of difference. Okay. I am preheating my oven. 400 degrees and I'm going to start baking these shortly. These have more than doubled in their size. Look, they're quite large now. They've been uh, two and a half hours rising. And I'm going to say this, yours may be totally different. How long it takes to rise this, I can't tell you how long it'll be. Your yeast is going to be different because the yeast in your air is different from the yeast in my air. Your barometric pressure affects this. The humidity affects this. The altitude affects this. Okay, so everything in your home is different from mine. So the rise time for you may be an hour. It may happen fast. Or it may be two hours. Or it may be three hours. For me, this is going to be closer to uh, what's well, going to be two and a half on one and uh, about three hours on the other. And either way, they're both gonna come out fantastic. So I'm just looking forward to it. So I need to move one of these over, make some space up here and get my water up and boiling. Take that water. Right up in there. Now, our oven is gaining a big cloud of steam in there. And that gives me a moment to take my pressure sprayer and I want to spray the top of this loaf. After I spray the top of it, and I'm not interested in spraying the sides because it's the sides and the bottom that have a hard time. It's the top that is going to get browning first and I want that to be kept as moist as absolutely possible. And that is, as I mentioned before, where these pressure sprayers come in handy, they can drop so much water so fast, it's just incredible. So here we go, into the oven. Alrighty. Alright, I'm going to set my timer here. And on this one, I'm going to set the timer at 28 minutes. So that's 400 degrees. Now something I need to mention oven spring. It isn't immediately springing up in the oven. Oven spring begins about three minutes after putting it in there and it will continue up till about 12 to 14 minutes after you put it in there. And that really depends on the size of the loaf and the temperature of the oven. The bigger the loaf and the cooler the oven, the longer the time it will be doing oven spring. But if you got a smaller loaf and a hotter oven, well that's going to happen really fast, so that time will be shortened. I want to remove my water pan from that oven after the oven spring is finished, so I want that water in there until that blossoming is done. After that, I will then use strictly my spray bottle, nothing else. Um, now, if I wanted a crispier, crunchier crust, 
I would be opening the oven about every three minutes and spraying the top of that thing, closing it back up and just doing that again and again and again. Be careful doing that because you can actually have a negative impact on the oven spring. Okay, that can work to your, not work to your advantage. So I like to just put it in there, leave it alone. Now folks, I've seen so many different gimmicks on cooking bread. Oh, heat the oven up to 500 degrees, put the dough in there, you know, your loaf in there, turn the oven off, walk off and come back when the oven's cool. Okay, mm. I guess if it works for you, it works for you, but I'm sorry. I cook other things, you know, what do I do with my oven, uh, you know, in 30 minutes when I want to slice bread and make garlic toast with it? Well, it doesn't work with that technique, does it? Okay, and the other technique is to just put your bread in the cold oven, turn the oven on, and let that preheat be part of the proofing and part of the oven spring time. So, you know, different approaches. I don't necessarily agree with them because some ovens will preheat faster and that preheat time can actually scorch the outside of your dough with the inside being completely uncooked. So it can work and you know, work against you. Now my method is simple. If I'm getting too much browning on top, I lower that oven temperature. So it increases the cooking time while decreasing how fast it browns. And that's what I did on this recipe. I brought it down from, I started at 475, then 450, then 425, now 400. And that's where I find a good balance, 400 degrees. It takes a little longer for me to cook it, but I get a much better quality bread this way. All right, I need to remove my water pan. All that steam, good beneficial steam. This, my oven spring has been doing beautiful. Turn him around, gets more even baking, spray the top. And I also spray my pan a little bit to get a little extra steam release around it right before closing the door. These are very handy. Um, as you've seen, not looking too bad already, huh? It just rose right up on us. Now all I have to do is get the right browning on it and it's all done. Now, about every three to four minutes, I'll open the oven at this point and retard the browning on the top of the loaf. Back up in there. Let's take a look at this loaf now. Let's see what I got going on here. Okay, it's coming along real nice. And it actually looks, if I wanted to give it a couple more minutes, I can do that. I'm going to. Two more minutes it is. Oh yes. Man, that's beautiful. This guy, I want him to cool down really nice. So, get a pan rack under it. That'll raise it up and help it cool off. Now I've got these beautiful little blisters over the outside of it. It's looking gorgeous. Let's take a close up look at this, okay? All right, now look at that. That, I oh, don't want to touch that pan, that sucker's hot. But I've got these nice little blisters on the outside which is a very good sign, exactly what I'm wanting. Good sound on it. I got some bottom browning, ouch, going on on that. The top looks good and firm. This will soften from the condition it is now. So let it cool completely, folks. Don't try cutting into it when it's hot. There's still cooking going on inside here. Well, here we go. Got them out of the oven. Looking absolutely gorgeous, folks. I did this one a little lighter than this one, and of course this one browned a little more even. Maybe that had something to do with a longer rise, don't know. Um, I did them identical as much as I possibly could. So you've seen a little bit of difference here, and I'm gonna be cutting into this pretty soon. 
but I have to let it cool first. And, uh, and I'll show you the inside here in just a little bit. But I wanted to mention, you know, this whole thing, let me pull this off. We have gone from here, a sourdough starter, and that took a couple of weeks to here we have our sourdough now this is a fresh batch but the one i used i went ahead and fermented overnight so it was 24 hours and then of course our beautiful bread which will only last moments on the palate but folks it is worth the effort and i'll tell you what this is such good bread and it's something that you're really going to enjoy now i'm going to fold this one more time i'm going to put it in the fridge and ferment it I could go ahead and form this dough out into loaves right now and do their final proof and cook them on up. They'd be fine, but they're gonna give better flavor if I ferment them overnight in the fridge. So 24 hours in the fridge and suddenly you've got dough that's gonna taste magnificent. Um, just the best way to do it, folks. So there you have it. This is sourdough. In a little bit, we're gonna cut into this, take a look on the inside of it, and you're gonna know what it's like. But right now I do want to mention, if this is just too much work for you, if you've gotten past doing all that and you don't want to, remember Wild Grains is a subscription model to fantastic sourdough breads. You pull them out of the freezer. Hang on, let me show you. You take their sourdough, you pull it out of the fridge, you pop this sucker into the oven, and when you pull it back out, you have a beautiful sourdough loaf without all the extra work. So, it's a neat way of doing it if you're not interested in working for it. Folks, we'll take a look at this in a moment, but that's all there is to the make right there. Now, this has had enough time to cool down, so I wanted to take a look inside. We're just gonna go right into it here. Now usually I will score that top crust with a serrated edge just like this because it can be quite difficult to get through. From there I like to use my chef's knife because it cuts the interior bread so smooth and even. It gives me a nice look. There we go. Now let's take a look here. All right, it looks like we have very interesting structure in this. Nice, fluffy, big air pockets going on all the way through it. Okay, big ones up on top there. And just exactly what I'm looking for. A lovely sourdough, a beautiful aroma. Mmm, that's just wonderful. And a bread that is definitely, definitely worth your time. Folks, give this recipe a shot. I'm absolutely certain you're going to fall in love with it. Let's take a nice close look up inside of that bread. Oh folks, look at that. That is absolutely magnificent. Absolutely what I was hoping for when I got started. And this is the one that overproofed. Look how well it came out. There it is. Came up with a beautiful loaf of bread. Mm. As you've seen, it's a process, yes. But what it yields is something fantastic. Beautiful texture, nice stretch to it. Mm. Mm. <laughs> Absolutely perfect. Mm. Folks, definitely try this recipe, try this technique. You're gonna find it pretty easy. It gives a really good quality bread. The flavor's spot on, the textures are there, the flavor's there, the look, all of it is perfect. Did I tell you about that flavor? Nothing like homemade sourdough. <laughs> Thanks for watching. Please do me a favor, take a look in the description box. Links are there for my website where you get the recipes. Also, links for wild grain if you don't want to make your own sourdough bread and don't forget every kitchen needs a good chef's thermometer so take a peek at that also drop me a comment in the comment section if you would please thumbs up it's always appreciated and if you haven't subscribed well, why not just, just subscribe go ahead thank you